Hello everyone. So we want to start talking about the heat exchangers. Uh, heat exchanger is, uh, is a system where we need to use all the concepts that we learn in heat transfer. And not only in heat transfer, also in uh, fluid mechanics and fluid flow. The, the main form of heat uh, heat transfer and also the heat, uh, the fluid flow that we have is uh, internal flow. Internal flow inside the pipes, inside channels, inside the shells. Uh, we have different forms of heat transfer, convection heat transfer, conduction heat transfer. Mainly we use convection, combination of convection, convection and conduction heat transfer in heat exchanger design and any in any form of heat exchangers. So this is a shell and tube heat exchanger. Inside the shell, we have fluid. Inside the tubes also, we have uh, <laughs> separate uh, fluid flow. Uh, so in each side, we have convection because we have fluid motions. So mostly the fluids are not stationary. They flow and uh, when I say a stationary, of course it's not a stationary and uh, we have some flow, but sometimes the, sometimes the flow is uh, natural. So we may have also natural conviction or combination of natural and forced conviction. So anyway, we have a combination of conviction and conduction transfer in heat exchanger. So whenever we want to design heat exchanger, we need to use all the equations that we use to calculate the convection transfer in external flow, in internal flow, conduction transfer through cylindrical wall, through plane wall, all those equations and concepts. The heat exchangers are widely used in a space heating, the air conditioning system, refrigeration, system, power stations, chemical plants, petrochemical plants, petroleum uh, refineries, natural gas processing, and sewage smear treatment. The classic example of a heat exchanger is found in an internal combustion engine in which a circulating fluid known as engine coolant flows through radiator coils and air flows has the coils which cools the coolant and heats the incoming air so we can release the heat from the engine components and heat exchanger has so one of the best known and well known heat exchanger that we deal with is radiators of the machines of the cars uh, there are so many applications of the heat exchangers in pharmaceutical industries, in power plants, as I said, and different forms of heat exchanger are used and designed. Now, a good part of the focus of the researchers are um, on compacted exchangers. What are compacted exchangers? The heat exchangers that can provide a large surface area through which we have heat exchange between two fluids or more in a very small, relatively a small volume. So whenever the large area of heat, heat transfer is provided with a small volume, total volume space of the heat exchanger unit, we can call it compacted exchangers. There are certain, uh, there, there is a, a certain number, then when we go beyond that, we can call the heat exchanger unit uh, compacted exchangers. A very typical form of heat exchanger is double tube or tubular heat exchangers. So in this form, we have one flow of, mm, uh, flow of a fluid inside central part and also central tube and another flow at the outer part or the annulus part of the heat exchanger. As I said, heat exchanger is a system used to transfer heat between two or more fluids. 
They are used in both cooling and heating processes and the fluid may be separated by a solid wall to prevent mixing or they may be in direct contact. So for example here, these, this wall, this, um, this almost orange, orangish wall or yellowish wall is separating the interior fluid from the fluid inside the annulus. We have different form of flow configuration. We may have counter flow or parallel flow. So as I said, we can consider this as a very basic form of heat exchanger. And the basic form of heat exchanger can be classified in this form, counter flow and parallel flow. What is parallel flow? Look at this arrangement. The, the hot flow and cold flow are entering the heat exchanger unit at almost the same side. So this is called parallel flow. So you see the flow in, inside the inner internal pipe and in the annulus are parallel, are going in the same direction. Okay, they have the same sense of flow. In this form of heat exchanger configuration of the fluid flows, at the inlet, obviously, the, heat, the temperature difference between the hot side and the cold side are significant, are more significant than the other parts of the heat exchanger. As they flow through the heat exchanger, obviously they exchange heat and the hot fluid lose energy and cold fluid gain energy, thermal energy. So its temperature increases and the hot fluid temperature decreases. So at the end, the heat, the temperature difference is gonna be less. It means we're gonna have more driving force at the inlet and the area closer, closer to the inlet than the outlet because the temperature difference is gonna decrease along the heat exchanger. So this is parallel flow heat exchanger. And how the heat transfer is happening. So if you look at here, the heat transfer inside the tube is convection. Then there is a heat transfer between the fluid inside and the inner surface of the inner fluid, inner pipe. Through the inner pipe wall, or the wall that is separating the inner fluid from the outer fluid is in the form of conduction transfer through the wall of the pipe. Then we have another convection inside this bluish area. So convection, conduction, and convection. So you have two main form of heat exchange, or thermal energy exchange. Also, we may have the same a structure, but different flow configuration. What's the difference? Just look at here. In this case, the ins inlet of the hot fluid is closer to the outlet of the cold fluid, or vice versa. Okay, inlet of the cold is at the same side where we have hot fluid outlet. So, there are some benefits of using this type of heat exchanger, and we're gonna see mathematically how it can benefit us and physically. In this case, if you look at the temperature change diagram, this is more or less qualitatively what we see in terms of temperature difference. The hot fluid obviously lose energy and cold fluid gain energy, thermal energy, the same way that have this, I mean, very similar to what we had in parallel flow in the previous slide. But here, the difference is, the temperature difference is more of uniform shape. I mean, it's not always this case. It's not always the case, okay? But, in a similar situation, we have more uniform temperature difference in counter flow than 
parallel flow. So the temperature difference significantly decreases here, but the, the temperature difference more or less ex stays the same for the same type of fluid and the same thermal conditions or the same inlet flow for the hot and cold fluids. And that gives us in average, in average over the entire, because the temperature difference obviously changes even in this case. In average, it gives us better temperature difference. And when we have better temperature difference in average, it means we have more driving force of thermal energy exchange. That means we're going to have more heat transfer from fluid, hot fluid to the cold fluid. And that's exactly what we want in heat exchanger. The whole purpose of heat exchanger is to have better heat transfer, higher rate of heat transfer for over a certain lengths or area. And we're going to talk about these more in, in the following slides, in the next uh, part of this lecture. How many types of heat exchanger we have? Thousands of them. But they tend to, in industry, they tend to classify it based on flow configuration, based on the based on how effective they are, based on the area versus the total volume of a unit of heat exchanger. So based on different factors. One of those classification is compact and non-compact heat exchangers. So we call heat exchanger compact when we have a very large area of heat transfer between cold and hot fluid. Look at this lower picture in here, okay? So here, obviously, if this is the cross flow of, let's say, is a cold flow flowing over this hot cylinder, and inside this circular pipe, cylindrical pipe, we have uh, hot fluid, okay? So the heat transfer area are the total area of these outer surface of these cylinders, of these pipes. What about this? What if instead of these, instead of just having flow over pipes, we have flow over pipes that are also thinned. So we call it, we call them extended surfaces. We call it, you know, we call these baffles that you see in here, fins. What's the difference between the upper case and the lower case? In here, for the same fluid, for the same velocity of the flow, uh, for the flow in both sides of heat, hot, and cold side, we have larger area of exposure of thermal energy from the hot fluid to the cold fluid. We have more contact area between the cold surface, cold fluid, and the hot side, or vice versa, the hot side and the hot, the hot fluid and the cold, cold surfaces. So we have better contact, more contact area between those fluids. And this is what we want. Then we have higher heat transfer area. In total, we're gonna have better heat transfer rate. These are called compacted exchanger. I mean, not necessarily. When the total area of heat transfer divided by total volume of the whole heat exchanger unit is larger than 700, we call them heat compacted exchangers. Okay, this exchanger is a, a gas to liquid compacted exchanger for residential air conditioning system. And this also can be considered as a compact exchangers. And also we may have another classification, mixed or unmixed flow. So here, what's the difference between lower shape and the upper shape? Here, the flow, let's say this is a cold fluid, cold fluid flow. It can mix in both directions. It can mix in this, it's called this Y, 
and x direction. So this flow can mix in y direction and also in x direction, right? So we can have heat, we can have temperature difference both in x and y direction. Here, the fluid is just directed, it just forced to move in x direction only and not in other direction that is y. So we are trying to avoid any mixing in y direction. So this compared to this one is unmixed. There are so many videos online. Uh, this is one of the videos you know, for a company that shows you how they build a heat exchanger that they call heat trick uh, heat exchanger. And that's kind of compact heat exchangers. It's a very interesting video. In addition to other videos that I post on my, that I put on the slides, uh, if it was on ground on ground uh, class, we would watch it together and we discuss uh, different features of those heat exchanger more. But feel free to ask me any questions if you have about these videos. Another type of heat exchanger that we have that is very typical is shell and tube heat exchanger. And again, I put a link to a video in here. Please watch them. I encourage you guys to, to watch these videos. They are very interesting. This video is, is very interesting. It explains the basic concept of shell and tube heat exchanger and the structure. So in shell and tube heat exchanger, uh, and it's one of the most common type of the exchanger in industrial applications, we have different two or more passes of tubes inside a huge shell. Okay, this type of the exchanger can be built in a very, very, very large scale. Very large, significantly large and huge. They contain, as mentioned in here, a large number of tubes, sometimes several hundred, passes of tubes packed in a shell with their axis parallel to that of the shell. And heat transfer takes place as one fluid flow uh, flows through the tubes while the other flow, fluid flows outside the tubes through the shell inside the shell. And they try to, in average, have flow paths inside the shell and tube such that it can be similar to counter fluid exchangers or they can gain the better performance of the unit in terms of heat transfer. The other type of heat exchanger also, other, other form of that is plate and frame or just plate heat exchanger. They also consider, mostly they are considered as Make compacted exchangers. I put these two videos in here. Please watch them. Uh, they are very interesting. They are mostly classified as compacted exchangers. They provide, they, they are very high efficient in terms of amount of heat transfer between hot fluid and cold fluid. Now, as I said, uh, the heat exchangers, in heat exchangers, we have convection transfer and conduction transfer, right? So for example, here you have convection inside the shell side, you have convection inside the tubes, and also you have conduction through the wall of the tubes. So there are three different mechanisms, separate mechanisms, they're combined, and we're gonna have heat exchange or thermal energy exchange inside the heat exchanger. So if you want to, so let's, let's consider you have this simple heat exchanger. You have double pipe heat exchanger. So you have fluid inside of the inner pipe. Then you have fluid inside the annulus. And you have heat transfer between those two fluid. But if you want to just give, give someone who are looking for a better heat exchanger, one unique 
value, one you need heat transfer coefficient, what would be the value that you provide? Do you give that person the convection transfer inside the annulus, let's call it A sub O, the convection transfer inside the inner tube A sub I, or conduction transfer or conductivity of the wall material, each one, because you have different, you know, three different mechanisms, two convections and one conduction, right? Because when you want to select the heat exchanger, it's easier to have access to one value instead of different values, right? Instead of giving the person who wants to select the heat exchanger three different numbers, what if we provide them with only one number that is a good representative of each heat exchanger? It's going to be really easy for selection of the heat exchanger unit. That's called overall heat transfer coefficients. Okay. So you remember we, you remember we had this concept, in thermal resistance, temperature difference divided by total resistance, right? And I can write this in this form some u that is called overall heat transfer coefficient, the area through which the heat transfer in average, I mean, the area that I consider through which the heat transfer is happening, and the temperature difference between two points. So look at, <coughs> look at this. Look at this a specific type of simple heat exchanger. What is gonna be your area? Area of heat transfer. Area at the annulus is pi D sub OL. Area in, at the inner part of the inner tube is pi D sub I L. So you have different area. It means depending based on which area you want to write this equation, you get different value for u. Are you going to consider a sub i as an uh, area of heat transfer, or heat transfer area, or a sub o? But this product, no matter which area you choose, this product is constant. So u sub i, a sub i, is equal to u sub o, a sub o. U sub i is the overall heat transfer coefficient based on the area A sub i, inner surface area. And U sub o is the overall heat transfer coefficient based on outer surface area of the inner pipe. Okay, so this U is called overall heat transfer coefficient, or Ua. So depending on the geometry of the heat exchanger, you may see Ua for for heat exchanger or U for heat exchanger. This is called overall heat transfer coefficient. I mean, SI unit, it has a unit of watt per meter squared degree Celsius. So it has the same unit as the unit of H, convection transfer coefficient, because convection transfer coefficient in SI had a unit, in SI system has a unit of watt per meter square degree Kelvin or degree Celsius. Okay, now how do we calculate this? You remember that when we have cylinder called wall, the thermal resistance of the cylinder called wall was calculated using this equation. Natural law of outer diameter divided by inner diameter or outer radius to inner radius divided by two pi conductivity of the substance material of the cylinder called wall times the length of the cylinder, right? Length of the cylinder called wall. Now, what is the total resistance between inner fluid and outer fluid? You have convection inside, you have convection outside, and you have conduction through the wall. So in total, you have 
resistance against conviction is con conviction is like resistance against conduction through the wall and resistance against conviction outside or conviction inside the annulus. One over h times a sub i, the con conviction heat transfer coefficients of the inner fluid, conviction heat transfer coefficient of the outer fluid, a sub o, and this equation that we have for cylinder con wall. A sub i and a sub o also mentioned here again. So this is total resistance. This total resistance is equal to one over ua. Overall heat transfer coefficient times area. Which area it depends. If you're just interested in the value of U, uh, ua, you already have it. One over ua is equal to R total resistance between those points. If you're interested in the U value, then you need to select the area, okay, according to this equation. So this is overall resistance, and overall resistance is equal to one over UA, and U is overall heat transfer coefficient. In such a geometry, is very interested in this product, UA, than U, because as I said, a really depends on which side of the heat exchanger you choose. Okay, so I just call it A sub S, the area through which the heat transfer is happening. One over UA is actually equal to one over UI, AI, one over UO, AO, and is equal to total resistance. That is equal to resistance against convection inside, resistance against conduction through the wall, and resistance against convection outside in the annulus part, okay. So as I said, this product stays the same, but these individual value U sub I is not equal to U sub O because the area are not the same. Unless the area is the same, let's say you have plain wall, then the areas are gonna be the same. So one special case that we have is when you have cylindrical wall, but your cylindrical wall is very thin. So the thickness of the cylindrical is very small. In this case, the area inside the inner tube is almost the same as area of the outer part of the inner tube. So this area here, this area at the outer part of this orange point is the same as inner surface of the orange point, right? Because this thickness is a small. And this is by the very thermal resistance network of this cylindrical wall between inner fluid and the fluid inside the annulus, okay? So in this case, in this extreme case, these two areas are the same, and I can call it just A sub S, so U's are the same. So since areas here are the same, they just cancel out. Okay, they just cancel out, and also since the thickness of the wall in, the, in this specific case only. The thickness of the wall is very thin. The wall is very thin. So this is almost zero. Because when the wall, when this wall is very thin, this yellow wall or orange wall is very thin, then there is no resistance against conduction. It's like there is nothing in between two fluids. So in this case, the overall heat transfer coefficient, the reciprocal of that is equal to one over A sub I plus one over A sub O. This is a good approximation of the overall heat transfer coefficient based on inside and outside fluid conviction, fluid flow heat transfer coefficients. Now, this equation gives us very important result. 
So this interesting result that we can, the interesting result that in conclusion that we can get from this equation is when you have two different fluids inside the heat exchanger and one of them is, let's say, let's say this, the convection transfer at the, inside the annulus is 100 watt per meter square Kelvin. And this is point 0.1, very small. So what do you think would be the value of the overall heat transfer coefficients? What is the value? So interestingly, the value of U is going to be around 0, 0, 9, 9, 9, 0. So you see, although one of the heat transfer coefficient is in the order of 100, the overall heat transfer coefficient is pretty low, is almost at the same order of A sub i. So U is very close to A sub i and is much smaller than 100 or A sub o. And that is always the case. It means the heat transfer coefficients, the overall heat transfer coefficients is dominated by the smaller convection transfer coefficients, by the fluid with the lowest heat transfer coefficients. That's why whenever you have a radiator, for example, or fan coil at home for the purpose of heating or cooling, you install fan next to the coil to increase the heat transfer coefficients of the air surrounding the coil, surrounding the radiators, because the heat transfer coefficient of the air that is a stationary in your room has much less than the heat transfer coefficient of the fluid or steam inside the radiators of your heater system. So we must be concerned about the lowest heat transfer coefficient and increase that heat transfer coefficient by installing extra surfaces, extended surfaces or increasing the fluid velocity at the side where the heat transfer coefficient is smaller. The <clears throat> overall heat transfer coefficient in average for different heat exchangers, in heat exchangers with different fluid to fluid uh, are mentioned in here. So water to water is between 850 to 1700 watt per meter square. Kelvin oil to oil is about 50 to 400 watt per meter square Kelvin. By the way, there are some values in here. There are a plus sign next to them. So those are based on air site surface area. And uh, so, but the purpose of this table is just look at some, as some average value of the heat exchangers overall heat transfer coefficient. So this explanation here refers to the previous table, to this table. So one more concept that we may need at some point for the design of heat exchanger is hydraulic diameter. What is hydraulic diameter? So let's say you have circular pipe. Obviously when you have circular pipe, 
to calculate the Reynolds number, what you use is the diameter of the pipe, right? But what if instead of a circular pipe, you have non-circular cross section? So like this, you have circular pipe. The, so this is how we calculate the circular, the non-circular pipe or even circular pipe hydraulic diameter. Hydraulic diameter is, al is also called vetted diameter. So a diameter of corresponding to the to a cross-sectional area based on which we can calculate the Reynolds number or other quantities where we need some characteristic lengths. Okay. D sub H is a hydraulic diameter. A is the area section of the duct or pipe, and P is the vetted perimeter of the duct or pipe. So look at these two shapes. The first one is a circular pipe. So if I use the previous equation, four times pi d squared divided by four, right, divided by pi d that is a perimeter or vetted perimeter, and it gives you d. So hydraulic diameter of a circular pipe is equal to diameter of the pipe. What about this annulus? For this one, for this annular space, what we need to calculate is hydraulic diameter. And hydraulic diameter is five times, four times the area of the, this cross section divided by vetted perimeter. What is the area? Area is, this shadowed part. So four times area based on the outer diameter minus area of the, according to the inner diameter. Four times this area divided by vetted perimeter. Vetted perimeter is this perimeter plus this perimeter. So this H plus that H. Okay, that is d2 plus pi times d, pi d2 plus pi d1, or pi times d2 plus d1. If we perform this calculation, what we get is this. Hydraulic diameter is a, of an annulus, is of an annular space, is d sub two minus d sub one. So the difference between outer and inner diameter, and we're gonna use it wherever we have this kind of cross section, instead of circular pipe. Example, we want to calculate overall heat transfer coefficient of a heat exchange. So hot oil is to be cooled in a double pipe, double tube counter flow heat exchanger. So the structure is double pipe, double in a counter flow. The copper inner tube has a diameter of two centimeter and a negligible thickness. So the, the wall thickness between inner fluid and outer fluid is very thin. That means the thermal resistance between two fluid is almost zero. So we don't have any thermal resistance against conduction between inner fluid and outer fluid. Okay, so we can use simplify equation for the calculation of overall heat transfer coefficient between inner and outer fluid. Okay. The inner diameter of the um, outer tube or the shell is three centimeter and water flows through the tube at the rate of 0.5 km, kilogram per second. And the oil through the shell at the rate of 0.8 kilog kilogram per second. Now, taking the average temperatures of the water and the oil to be 45 degrees Celsius, and 80 degrees Celsius respectively, what is the overall heat transfer coefficient of this heat exchanger? Why average, heat, average temperature? Because obviously at the inlet, hot oil has higher temperature than at the outlet. 
At the inlet of the cold side, we have lower temperature than the outlet of the cold side. So when you want to calculate the properties, what temperature you use, okay, when you have inner, inner, these are called inner flow. Okay, when you have internal flow to calculate the, to read, temp, to read the properties, you need to read the properties at mean temperature. So some average temperature over entire length of the heat exchanger at each side. And here we are given those temperature, 45 and 80 degrees Celsius. And also, we're going to use this table to solve for the calculation of heat transfer coefficient at the annulus, at the annular part. The properties of the water at 45 degrees Celsius is written, is, re, is read from table A15, and also properties of the oil at 80 degrees Celsius, because these are the temperature that are given as the as average temperature for the hot and cold side, the oil side and the water side. So at those temperature, we read the properties, conductivity of the water, density of the water, parental number of the water, kinematic viscosity that is equal to dynamic, divide, dynamic viscosity divided by density, uh, for oil, density, conductivity, parental number, and kinematic viscosity. So now that we have our properties, also for the oil side, we have annulus, we have annular space, right? The space between inner tube and outer tube. So to calculate the velocity and the Reynolds number, we need some Characteristic length. What is that characteristic length? Is hydraulic diameter. Hydraulic diameter for the annular space is the difference between inner and outer diameter, according to what we did in the slide before the before this exam. So the velocity also is mass flow rate divided by density times the cross-sectional area of the annular space. The mass flow rate is given as 0.8, density we just read from the table, and the area is this. This is the cross-sectional area of the annular space, okay? The annular space between inner and outer tube. So 2.39 meter per second. Now, we use this velocity based on this cross-sectional area and mass flow rate. And this hydraulic diameter, this is a representative of the annular space to calculate the Reynolds number. Reynolds number is velocity times diameter divided by kinematic viscosity. Okay, this diameter is the hydraulic diameter because the area, the surface, the cross-section is not circular, is annulus. So 6.30, 630, 630, as you remember, since is less than 2300, tells us that the flow inside the annular, annular space is laminar. Okay. So since it's laminar, we can use this table to find the nozzle number at this side, at the, at the, at the annulus part, okay. So what we need to read is this. So the ratio between inner diameter and outer, um, uh, outer diameter of the annulus space, annular space is 0.667. So between these two, if we perform the interpolation, 
So the value is somewhere in between 574 and 486. And it's gonna be, I'm sorry, between these two. Between, I would say if we perform the, so it's 0 0.667, so, so I want to go over the solution again. So first we read the properties for the oil and the water at those temperatures that are given in the problem statement. After reading this, so first we the start, uh, we start the, the flow inside the circular pipe. Okay, inside the circular pipe, to calculate the Reynolds number, we need to know the velocity. Velocity is mass flow rate divided by density times the cross-sectional area of the inner pipe. Okay, mass flow rate is 0.5 kilogram per second, density uh, of the water, and that temperature times the area, cross-sectional area through which we have the flow of water. So the velocity is 1.61 meter per second. The Reynolds number, velocity times diameter, divided by kinematic viscosity of the water that we had it in here, okay, for water at 45 degrees Celsius. So Reynolds number is very large. You remember when the Reynolds number is 4,000, then the flow is turbulent. I mean, it depends. Sometimes they say it must be larger than 10,000 to consider the flow to be true, fully turbulent. But here we can just use 4,000. So less than 2,300 we have for internal flow, not external. External was different. It was three times 10 to the five, or five times 10 to the five. When is less than, you know, or when it was larger than uh, three times 10 to the five, or five times 10 to the five, we could consider it as turbulent that we have, then we had external flow. But here, we have um, internal flow. So Reynolds number is larger than, for the water side, is larger than 4,000, I don't want to use 10,000 in here. So it's turbulent. Since it's turbulent, now we need to use some equation. This is not, uh, this is the equation that you will use whenever you have internal flow, not external, because you had some equation for Nusselt number, local and average value, but those were, mm, those were for the flow over flat plate. Here we have internal flow. When you have internal flow and you have heating of the fluid, here the hot fluid is oil, right? And the cold fluid is water. So you have heating of the water, then you use this equation. So turbulent flow, Reynolds number larger than 4,000, and your, you have heating, of the fluid, then this is the equation that you use for the calculation of Nusselt number for internal flow in the circular part. So Nusselt number is calculated, so convection transfer coefficient for the water side is calculated. I am gonna go over this equation after finishing this example again. Now for the annular part, for the annulus, this is the hydraulic diameter. I calculate the velocity corresponding to the mass flow rate inside that is space. I calculate the Reynolds number. Reynolds number is pretty small. It's less, less than 2300. So we have laminar flow. Laminar flow. And then since it's annulus space, it's not circular pipe, I don't have an equation to calculate the Nusselt number. So I use these table, table 22-3 as an estimation, okay? So the ratio of the inner and outer diameter for annular space is 0.667.
I go here and 0.667 is between 0.5 and 1. So if I perform the if I perform the interpolation, the Nussel number is between these two values. So it's going to be 5.45. 5.45. This is the Nussel number at the inner part of the annular space. This is a Nussel number at the outer part of the annular space. This is not what we need for this problem. We have, we need inner part of the annular space. Okay. We need inner part of the annular space. So 5 for 45. Again, I use simple Nussel number equation. Correlation, Nussel number is equal to H times diameter divided by K. Here, diameter is hydraulic diameter. So the H of the annular part is, so here is Nussel sub I, and here I'm using A sub O. Please keep in mind that here, this is a Nussel number inside the annular space. This is a Nussel number outside annular space. We don't need this. So this is our basically the Nussel number corresponding to H at the annular space. So I calculate the H, and from here, I can calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient according to the equation that we have. So again, you see, the, although the heat transfer coefficient inside the water is very large, but since the heat transfer coefficient for the oil side is very small, the overall heat transfer coefficient value is closer to this, even as smaller than the heat transfer coefficient to the oil side. As I said, overall heat transfer coefficient is dominated by the heat transfer coefficients that is a smaller. So this confirms that our earlier statement that the overall heat transfer coefficient in the heat exchanger is dominated by the smaller heat transfer coefficient when the difference between the two values is very large. So in our example, in the example that I provided you, we had heat transfer coefficient of 0.1 and 100, and the value was, the overall heat transfer coefficient value was 0 0.0999. So it was, a small, it, was, it was even a smaller than 0.1. And here we have similar situation. So I wanna go over some concept that we, I already used it in the previous example for pipe flow. Because we talked about the Nussel number correlations, the specific correlations for external flow. We didn't talk about internal flow or pipe flow specifically when we have convection. So keep in mind that whenever the Reynolds number is less than 2300 is laminar, and whenever is larger than 4000 is turbulent. To calculate this, if you have annular space or any other cross section different from circular cross section, you need to use hydraulic diameter as a diameter. Okay. Now, and the properties must be read, must be read at some average temperature. In the previous example, we read the properties from corresponding tables at 45 degrees Celsius and 80 degrees Celsius, the temperatures that we were given. But what about the Nussel number? I used some Nussel number correlation in the problem, in the previous problem example. In the example, we had, we had turbulent flow in the annular space. So here, I'm sorry, in the circular pipe, in the inner pipe, not the annular space, we have turbulent flow. So use this equation. Where this equation is coming from? So let's say you have laminar flow. Okay, your Reynolds number is less than 2300. You have two conditions. You may have a pipe with a constant surface temperature, and more specifically, the surface, the inner surface, 
So if you have a flow passing through this point, your nozzle number is a constant value of 3.66, so you don't need any correlation. If instead of constant temperature, if you have constant heat flux at the surface of the pipe, your nozzle number is 436. So if you have laminar flow, fully developed, fully developed laminar flow inside the circular pipe, then your nozzle number is between 3.66 to uh, 436, depending on whether you have constant temperature, thermal condition or constant heat flux. But in the previous example, in a circular pipe where we had, where we had flow of water, we had turbulent flow. Here we can use Datos Bolter equation. So Datos Bolter equation tells us that when the Reynolds number is larger than, let's say 4,000, I don't want to say specifically 10,000, the Reynolds number corresponding to the flow of the turbulent flow. You can calculate nozzle number using this, this equation. In this equation, the, so Reynolds number times Prandtl number for that fluid. Prandtl number has a power n. And let's say you have heating of that specific fluid, then you need to use a power of 0.4. If you have cooling of that fluid, you need to use a power of 0.3. So in this, in that previous example, we had, in the previous example, we had, uh, we had a cold fluid water and it was being heated by the oil inside the annular space. So we had heating of the cold fluid that was water. We had a heating of the fluid flow inside the pipe where we had turbulent flow. So we had heating. The water was colder than oil, so we had heating of the oil. So we used power 0.4. Okay. So let's say in this, in this previous example, for the fluid inside the inner point, this Reynolds number was less than 4,000, and the fluid inside the pipe that was water at 45 degrees Celsius, it was at 100 degrees Celsius, and you get Reynolds number larger than 4,000, and the oil was colder than water. So then you had cooling of the water inside the pipe, inside the circular pipe, and instead of using power 0.4, you had to use power 0.3 in here to calculate the nozzle number for the water. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.